Thank you for coming to help us celebrate this wonderful occasion. Apologies for my voice. I'm, I've got the, um, the lurgy. I thought I'd get through the winter without it, but unfortunately I've just got it. Um, OK, thank you to the department for organising this wonderful event. And in particular, I'd like to thank Annie Gabriel. I'm sure she's here. Uh, for putting this, th this together, a job well done. Okay, I'm going to talk about the evolution of ozone depleting substances in the Australian atmosphere. And uh, moving right along. So what are ozone depleting substances? Well, in the context of the Montreal Protocol, an ozone depleting substance is any chemical containing chlorine and or bromine, which after release into the lower atmosphere, can be transported to the stratosphere where they break down, releasing reactive chlorine and bromine that can sig significantly destroy stratospheric ozone. Uh, there are more than 100 ODSs identified for regulation under the Montreal Protocol, which is an international agreement designed to protect the stratospheric ozone layer by controlling ODS production and consumption. Now, some examples are, I'll get this to work, the CFCs, which you're probably familiar with, for example, CFC-12, a well-known refrigerant, now no longer in use. The HCFCs, HCFC-22, uh, which is also a, a refrigerant, still in use, uh, in particular in the developing world, and the halons, the bromine containing firefighting chemicals, is another typical ODS. These have been phased out from use because they are a particularly potent ozone-depleting chemical. So where did it all begin? Well, for me, uh, it began here in Canberra in 1974. I was a, uh, a restless postdoctoral fellow at the, in the research school of chemistry at ANU. And I was looking for, I must admit, I was looking for a change in direction in my career. And I read this paper by Molina and Rowland. I distinctly, I can still remember it sitting in the library reading this paper. And the, the key words in the paper were that chlorofluoromethanes are being added to the environment in steadily increasing amounts. These compounds are chemically inert and may remain in the atmosphere for up to 150 years. And concentrations can be expected to reach 10 to 20 times present levels. Photo dissociation of chlorofluoromethanes in the stratosphere produces significant amounts of chlorine atoms leading to the destruction of atmospheric ozone. This was a hypothesis. They had no, no proof of it, uh, except in laboratory experiments. Uh, well, I, uh, I must admit, this, this, this paper really had an influence on me. A few weeks later, I was being interviewed for a job with CSIRO, and I was asked you know, what chemicals might be important to measure in the atmosphere, and I said, well, CFCs, they're going to destroy the ozone layer. Um, I didn't know anything about CFCs at the time, but I thought that was an appropriate answer. <coughs> So I got the job with CSIRO and Molina and Rowland won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Pretty good. So having, having convinced CSIRO that I knew something about CFCs, I thought I'd better write to someone who really knew something about CFCs, and that was James Lovelock. So having joined CSIRO, I wrote to Jim Lovelock, uh, not knowing who Jim was, except that he'd written a wonderful paper in 1973 in Nature about the global distribution of CFCs in the atmosphere. Um, I was to later find out, of course, he was the inventor of the... He was already a fellow of the Royal Society. I didn't know that. He was, in, he was the inventor of the electron capture detector. And the controversial... Well, the author of the controversial book later in his life, Dyer, A New Look, of, uh, a New Look at Life on Earth. And, of course, he won the prestigious... Probably the world's most prestigious environmental prize, the 1997 Blue Planet Prize. But my question to Jim was, how do I measure CFCs? <laughs> since I've got this job where I, they expect me to measure CFCs. And his answer was, well, you, you use uh, gas chromatography with an electron capture detector, which was the detector he invented a few years before. But not only that, he said, I'll visit your lab and I'll teach you how to do it. So he came and visited our lab in June of 1975. We set up the instrument he brought. He brought it in his suitcase. And we made the first measurements of CFCs, methyl chloroform and carbon tet, all important ODSs, the first measurements in the Australian atmosphere in June of 1975. Soon after that, we were established a, um, Australia's first baseline station on the west coast of Tasmania, a place called Cape Grim. And one of the first instruments we installed there was that very same instrument I'd, that Jim Lovelock had brought to our division a year before. And so we started the first continuous measurements 
of ODSs in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, soon after that, I, I also started collecting air samples in the, what's called the Cape Grim Air Archive, collecting four samples per year and putting them away, thinking that maybe in the future we could use these air samples uh, to look for other ozone depleting substances in the atmosphere, and certainly that was the case. And thanks to the work of Jim Lovelock, we were invited to join the A-Gage program in 1978, which is an international network of ozone depleting monitoring stations right around the world. So we got off to a really flying start, mainly through the assistance of Jim Lovelock. Uh, here is the, uh, the A-Gage network uh, as it is today, with the five major stations that are measuring ozone depleting substances right around the world. Um, you have the, um, the station at Macehead in Ireland, very close to orig Jim's original, Jim Lovelock's original station at Adrigal. Uh, the station at Trinidad Head in California on the west coast. Ragged Point Barbados in the Caribbean. Cape Matatula, American Samoa. And of course, Cape Grim, Tasmania. You can see now the, uh, the, uh, the station is a very sophisticated building and tower complex, as opposed to the original caravan we first set up there. We're currently measuring about 35 ODSs in the background atmosphere at Cape Grim. Uh, 27 of those we're measuring 12 times a day, 365 days a year, um, including six CFCs, five HCFCs, three halons, four chloromethanes, five bromomethanes, and some haloethanes and ethenes and propanes. Uh, in addition, uh, we, may, we have measured seven other ODSs, but we're not measuring those continuously. Another four CFCs, some HCFCs and halons. Now the ODSs that I've, you can see in this slide in red are the 16 ODSs that are used to define internationally a, 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 a parameter we call equivalent stratospheric chlorine. And it's from the, from the uh, abundance of those chemicals in the atmosphere and their trends tied to what predictions of what we think these chemicals will do in the future in the atmosphere that we use to predict how the ozone layer will behave in the future and when we might anticipate to see ozone recovery. The three key elements underpinning the Australian ODS research are our station at Cape Grim in Tasmania that I've mentioned already, the Cape Grim Air Archive, where these are the samples of baseline air that we've archived away every year, four samples per year since 1978. And our access to uh, fern air from, from Law Dome in Antarctica, which can take us back in history about 100 years or so to get us to a point where these ozone depleting chemicals were, were, were either not in the atmosphere or just starting to emerge. Um, the first example I'll show is, carbon, is uh, CFC12 at Cape Grim. The data in green are the annual means for CFC12. The data in red are the annual means from the Cape Grim Air Archive. The data in blue are the, air, the, the, the uh, concentrations we get from the Antarctic fern air. The line is a synthesis of all these, uh, these data. And you can see, for example, CFC-12 first emerged into the atmosphere not long after it was invented by General Motors in the 1940s in their frigid air division as a, as a, um, a safe and uh, uh, non-flammable refrigerant. Unfortunately, it's got a lifetime in the atmosphere of 120 years, which means it can transport significant amounts of chlorine to the stratosphere. But of course, General Motors knew nothing of that in the 1940s. It, is, it, is, it, it will be a major source for stratospheric chlorine in decades to come. Now here, here you can see what's happened to the emissions. The emissions peaked at about 500,000 tonnes per year in the late 1980s and have been steadily declining. In fact, there's been an 85% decline in emissions under the Montreal Protocol. So the emissions have fallen to less than 100,000 tonnes now which is a wonderful achievement. Of course, the concentration doesn't respond that quickly. With this enormous atmospheric lifetime, the, the, uh, the, the time taken for the CFC-12 to be removed from the atmosphere is, is 100 years or more. 
Another success story of the Montreal Protocol is methyl chloroform. Uh, this is a degreasing solvent popular in the 1980s. Again, you can see the green data are the annual means we measure at Cape Grim, the red are the annual means from the archive, the blue are the Antarctic fern data, and you can see there was virtually none of this chemical in the atmosphere in the 1930s and 40s, took off in the 1960s, reached a peak at about 120 parts per billion in 1990, and has now virtually disappeared again from the atmosphere. So this is a remarkable story of controlling a, an important chemical that could transport chlorine to the stratosphere. And here are the emissions, peaked at about 700,000 tonnes in 1990, have now virtually fallen away to zero. The other major success story of the Montreal Protocol is methyl bromide, a difficult compound to measure in the atmosphere, um, but the, the story is basically the same. Um, the green data are the annual means at Cape Grim, the red are from the archive, and the blue are the fern data. Again, you can see now methyl bromide has a natural component. There is a source from the oceans, so there will always be a background level of methyl bromide in the atmosphere at something less than six parts per trillion. It peaked in 1990 at about uh, between eight and nine parts per million and is now decli declining away. You'll notice the decay is slowing down and we're unlikely to get back to, to background levels. And the reason for that is, of course, there is a, a component of the emissions, the anthropogenic emissions of methyl bromide that are not controlled by the Montreal Protocol. That's the quarantine emissions. Um, and in fact, the quarantine emissions are likely increase, uh, to be increasing. So it's potentially possible that this methyl bromide level will drop, level out, and maybe even start increasing again, depending on the amount of methyl bromide that will be used for quarantine use, and whether, of course, quarantine use ultimately comes under the control of the Montreal Protocol. The emissions, of course, have declined quite significantly to, uh, to an almost approaching 100,000 tonnes from a, a peak of about 180,000 tonnes. Well, the, the fourth compound I'll look at very briefly is HCFC141B, uh, only to show a couple of things. One is that the, the growth rate was quite significant in the 90s. It seemed to level off as the developing world was phasing out of this chemical, took off again because the developed, the, sorry, the developed world phased it out, but the developing world took over. It's quite a popular chemical in the developing world, and so the emissions are rising again. They, they peaked. Uh, in the year 2000, they started to drop off, which is what we expected under the Montreal Protocol. Unfortunately, they've started to rise again because of, of expanding use in the developing world, but we do expect that to come under control in the next few years, and ultimately we will see a decline in the emissions of this chemical. The other feature I wanted to point out are these spikes in the record, which I didn't show in the other data, and these are what's called local pollution episodes at, at Cape Grim. And from those data, we were able to estimate local regional emissions of this chemical. Um, the baseline data, the, the orange data, from those we can calculate global emissions of the chemical, and from these spikes we can calculate regional or Australian emissions of this chemical, and that's the two ways in which we use the data. Here is the, here is the um, total impact of the Montreal Protocol and the pre-Montreal Protocol era in, in the evolution of ODSs in the atmosphere. So you have your natural background level of methyl bromide and methyl chloride. Then you have this major input of chlorine from the CFCs, methyl chloroform and carbon tetrachloride, a small but growing input from the HCFCs and a very significant input from the halons because they contain bromine. You can see that the, um, the total effective chlorine in the atmosphere peaked uh, at about four, just over four parts per billion and is now on this steady decline. And that's what we're looking for under the Montreal Protocol, a steady decline of stratospheric chlorine now and into the future. And that's what these lines are. There's, these are the predicted uh, decay of stratospheric chlorine in the future as these chemicals are phased out completely and the atmosphere takes its time to destroy them back to, um, so we, we can get back to background levels. And it's likely we'll return to 1980 levels by about 2050. I just wanted to show some use of the data in terms of column ozone. Um, 
data and how uh, the, the effect of chlorine in the atmosphere can be used as perhaps as a predictor of what's going to happen with ozone. OK, here's the, here's the in green, uh, the October mean ozone levels at Halley Station in Antarctica. This is the famous Halley Station record, the so-called, which was, which was the first station to identify the so-called Antarctic ozone hole. You can see ozone levels in 1960 were around 300 Dobson units fell away dramatically to 2000 to, to uh, down by a factor of two to 150 Dobson units. So this is a very dramatic uh, loss of ozone in Antarctica, which has been attributed to the ozone depleting chemicals. And now we're starting to see, we think, a slow recovery in ozone. The, the red line is in fact the, uh, the, the calculation of the effective stratospheric chlorine in the atmosphere uh, based on the atmospheric observations we've made at Cape Grim and at other stations around the world. And you can see there is a nice correlation. It's, of course, it's plotted in the inverse. So as the ozone goes down, was going down here, the, the effective chlorine was going up from, from zero to uh, four parts per trillion. And you can see now we're on this track of, going of, of, uh, of um, uh, declining levels of um, chlorine and a corresponding increase in the ozone. The same, I've got some wonderful data here too from Melbourne, from Matt Tully at the Bureau of Meteorology. Here's what's happened to ozone over Melbourne. Again, a dramatic decline uh, from 1980 through to 2000 and now some signs of recovery, beautifully mirrored by the, the uh, calculations of effective chlorine in the atmosphere uh, above Melbourne, in the stratosphere above Melbourne. So that's all very, very positive news. One, one feature of the, uh, of the Montreal Protocol that's not often discussed is in fact it's been a very effective climate mitigation policy. Here we see the, uh, the uh, CO2 equivalent emissions of all the ODSs. So all the ODSs in the released to the atmosphere accounted for about 9,000 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent in 1990. And globally that's declined as the CFC's emissions and the halon emissions and the methyl bromide emissions have declined. That's come down to about 2,000 million tonnes. I think a significant uh, reduction in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And in this, we were able to actually calculate that for Australia and we were able to show that the Australian emissions of ODSs have declined by about 30 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. That's about 5% of Australia's total greenhouse gas emissions. It's the equivalent of taking about 300,000 cars off the road. And in the period that uh, 1990 to 2010, that's our CO2 emissions have risen by 125 meg, uh, million tonnes. Our, 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 our CO2 equivalent emissions from ozone depleting chemicals have declined by 30 million tonnes. So it's a very, very successful and, and not often recognised um, component of um, tackling the, the, the climate change problem. Okay, here's the achievements. I won't, uh, won't dwell on these. Uh, continuous measurements in the southern hemisphere, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'd like to uh, dedicate the talk to the memory of the late Sherry Rowland, died earlier this year. Um, the Nobel Prize winner in 1995 for that work in that Nature paper that, that I described at the start. A brilliant career, Sherry, uh, Japan Prize in 1989, President of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 93, the Dubai Award from the American Chemical Society in 93, the Roger Revelle Medal from the American Geophysical Union in 94, and of course the Nobel Prize in 95. As Mario said at his, uh, at his dedication uh, 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 earlier this year, he inspired many to walk in the shadow of his greatness and certainly that's true for me, he inspired me. Thank you.